Chapter 2. Too Much, Too Soon. This chapter will be a thorough deconstruction of the craft of stand-up comedy. The subject itself warrants volumes because stand-up is extremely complex in practice and requires or even demands an expertise and a remarkable capacity of perception in the fields from language comprehension to the elite capacity for dissecting human behavior. All of the issues raised in this chapter will either be fully addressed within this chapter itself or put into fine detail in the subsequent chapters. The entertainment, the good, the drudgery, the catch. The good. Stand-up comedy is the acme of behavioral manipulation and coercion. If you can solve the comedic Rubik's Cube, if you can find the proceeds in the conundrum, how do I make a body of strangers react audibly to my expression? You have developed an inalienable skill, a power that has a wide variety of applications and commands attention beyond the realm of the ordinary. It is a manipulation bordering on superhuman. If you have the power to affect others involuntarily, you, in effect, play the role of Geppetto. Success, people say, it's who you know. They are saying that it is not the skill nor the talent that you bring forth, but rather the connections you have that will get you ahead in life. And there is truth to this. But a supersession to this adage is made by those possessing the ability to make strangers act, beyond the will of strangers themselves. Success in the field of stand-up comedy can be considered akin to multilingualism or the craft and disposition of Jason Bourne or 007. It is rhetoric on steroids. The catch. Unfortunately, being a comedian is extremely difficult. It is much more difficult than it appears, i.e., when you watch a terrible comedian tank a set and think to yourself, I can do better than that, you probably can't. And when you watch a seasoned veteran make stand-up comedy look easy, it's not. It's a complex and dynamic field fit for failure. After a decade in the office of comic, retrospectively, I find that comedians come and they go. That is to say, roughly all comedians get spit out the same birth of this revolving door. The lucky ones tap out early. The stubborn ones are masochists, and the ones who thrive on misery and refuse to stop such foolishness might just be rich, might also be famous, but rarely does one find a worthy return in this investment. It is work. It is so much damn work. The good news is that stand-up can be taught. Better said, comedy can be learned. Success in stand-up comedy has two prerequisites, neither of which are natural sense of humor. First, foremost, if you want to make it as a comedian, you need a tireless and relentless, unwavering and enduring resolution to get good. You need to face failure and embarrassment, jealousy and endless miscalculation. You need to callous the adversity to step forward, learn and develop. The second requirement is an acute intellect. If you're intelligent and you refuse to give up, you'll figure out how to make it as a comedian. An inborn sense of humor helps. It expedites the process. But if you have the drive and you possess the brains, you can figure it out. So the question remains, how does one do stand-up comedy? Before we address the process in depth, we will step forward and illuminate two factors that stand out and should be regarded as the brass, boss, and bottom line to the trajectory of any career in stand-up comedy. Beyond talent, success is entirely contingent upon and directly proportional to the amount of time one writes, edits, refines, and exercises material, and the amount of time one spends on stage honoring the art of performance. If you want to be a comedian, you need to work hard. There's no way to circumvent this. You need to work, but more importantly, you need to work harder. You need to work more. There's no sleight of hand in the field. In my first year of stand-up, I had the fortune of doing a show with a veteran, well-established comedian, Jim Gaffigan. I told him I wanted to drop out of college and become a full-time comedian, a statement that was met with an expression best described as disagreement. He told me, I remember being where you are, looking for any way to make this work, looking for a trick like, if I do 50 sit-ups a day, then I'll be a comedian. But there's no secret like that. Jerry Seinfeld, when asked about the merit of comedy conventions and comedy classes, expressed disapproval, stating, they really need to cancel all the keynote speakers and experts on the subject and just hang up a big banner in the hall that says work. What Gaffigan and Seinfeld are saying, and saying from the have-achieved end of success, 
is that there's no way around the grit and grind. There's no secret. There's no way to skirt the labor involved becoming a comedian. We need to write, and we need to spend time on stage. And when we have done this, we need to write more and spend more time on stage. That is what Seinfeld's banner represents. And there really is no need for any other interpretation. It's not meant to be ambiguous in the least. You want to be a comedian? Well, work. Work more, work harder, period. Writer's block is for amateurs. Charles Schultz. There are volumes written on the topic of stand-up comedy. How-tos, who's who, memoirs, collections of one-liners, retrospectives. Most of these, like any other body of literature, have insights and offer something valuable with regard to the subject. What is ultimately found is that the literature in our field falls markedly shy of what is needed and what is known to be a comedian, and by seasoned comedians, respectively. My goal here is to address stand-up comedy and fill in some of the gaps, impart the tools, insights, hints, and tricks of the trade. The start must assert the daunting task ahead. Comedy is one of the most complex and resolutely elusive studies in the field of what could be considered the behavioral sciences. So an apology is in order before I Jackson Pollock my way through this convoluted labyrinth of art. Stand-up comedy, a new dissection. Contemporary stand-up is delivered in one of two ways. Dictatorial delivery, theatrical delivery. A bit is a body of jokes that fit together seamlessly and are generally bookended by transitional material. Some bits have three punchlines, Rodney Dangerfield, and others are half-hour diatribes on a subject, Doug Stanhope. Dictatorial writing is delivered to an audience without what is typically called the fourth wall. When you watch a movie, no character on the screen looks directly into the camera and speaks to you. The person in the audience, in the theater, watching the movie, the action takes place as the actors act and the story unfolds, as if the viewer does not exist. This really plays to the joy of voyeurism. When a movie or a play takes place without acknowledging the viewer, the illustrative barrier between the action and the viewer is known as the fourth wall. Comedy delivered directly to the audience without pretending there is a fourth wall is what I call dictatorial delivery. When a comedian delivers dictatorial work, the comedian is talking directly to the people in the crowd. Theatrical stand-up is comedy where the comedian is acting out a scenario or scene, typically playing multiple characters as the art of stand-up is a solo endeavor. A theatrical bit is typically set up in a dictatorial fashion, then the scenario is relayed to the audience much like a movie or play, or with the fourth wall. Here's an example of the same joke expressed both ways. 1. Dictatorial writing. My mother called me irresponsible, but I'm a drug addict with her credit card information, so who's really irresponsible here? 2. Theatrical writing. My mom said, Dan, you're very irresponsible. Yeah, ma? because I'm a drug addict with your credit card information, so who's really irresponsible? Trust me on this. When in doubt, always defer to theatrical writing and delivery. Roughly every comedian of our time uses elements of both. Nevertheless, I have found that setting up concepts and acting them out typically draws more of a response from an audience. This being a soft science leaves no definitive reasoning as to why one approach sells better than the other approach. It should be noted that the theatrical approach to comedy is less abrasive, less confrontational. Putting up the fourth wall allows for the audience to take down their guard. Because you're not speaking directly to them, they're not part of the conversation, so it is easier for them to sink into comfort. And when their guard is down and the spotlight is not on them, they feel free to laugh without an ounce of self-consciousness. This trick is helpful, albeit tangential. When you write out an act, it is typically a dialogue or a conversation between two people. You need to come to terms with the obvious. You're acting out the voice of two distinct and different people. This is obvious, but that being said, how do you portray a scenario involving two people when they clearly have separate voices? There are several things to consider. First, it is pathetic to overact the part. You never want to come off as trying too hard. Trying too hard is the precarious pitfall of the comedian doing separate voices, separate genders, or separate accents. So there are a few solutions to this dilemma. The first is not to act out the separate voices at all. You can use your own voice 
and write or phrase the dialogue such that it is clear to the audience that although you are not making distinct the separate voices of different people, based on grammatical cues built into the joke, one can clearly and effortlessly comprehend where one half of the dialogue ends and the speech of another character begins. An example with one trick being the use of my name. Dan, where are we? We're in hell. Then what time is it? Forever. Dan, what is Margaret doing? She's getting beaten with a wrench. The wording here clearly indicates where one party stops speaking and the other counterpoint picks up the dialogue. A comedian can deliver both characters in his or her own voice because it's grammatically clear where the distinctions lie. A simple way to reinforce the distinctions is to contrast the two voices in any one or more aspects that are still well within your speaking voice. One character can speak more slowly and deliberately than the other. The easiest distinction that takes no training is to have one of the characters speaking loudly, while the other one has a moderate volume. Ultimately, if you're going to keep your speaking voice throughout playing both characters, stay safe by writing clear and defined grammatical beginnings and ends. Another thing you can do as a comedian is use your own voice for each character, but cut off the end of the sentence showing a common interruptive punctuation of dialogue. People routinely interrupt each other. Verbally, it's easy to spot the change of speakers when grammatical structures indicate a different and separate phrase or clause, implying a change in speakers. When doing this, it helps to make distinct separate pitches or timbres between the two voices. So if one character is cut short during low energy, low pitch word or phrase, the other character in the conversation comes in at a markedly higher pitch and energy level. Same applies to the change of pace between the characters portrayed in the scene. If it is all possible to turn dialogue you have written into a one-sided single character act out, it is in your best interest to make it a single character. It's less demanding on you and less convoluted for the audience. Personally, I find this to be the best way to express a theatrical concept. In the writing of this approach, we just take the dialogue already written and pretend I'm only listening to one of the parties as if we were listening to this character speaking by phone. The problem needing a resolution here is how to convey all the necessary information. This approach to theatrical delivery should be used whenever possible because it makes our comedic concepts more cohesive and direct. This approach becomes more apparent the more you write and deliver material. Look at your dialogue and ask yourself, can I get all the necessary information across using one voice? In this way, a conversation might initially look like this. Me. I'm about to leave now. Margot. Where are you going to go? Me. I'm just going back home. What are you up to? Margot. I'm going to waste my life memorizing dates for an art history exam. Can I get the requisite information across through one voice? Would it be more concise with a single voice? Would this be easier to deliver with only one character? Yes, yes, and yes. Here it is. Me. I'm out of here. Internet porn beckons from my desktop. What are you up to? Wasting your youth not banging disease-free freshmen in the dorms. I'm going to be a historian. Whatever. It's your life. Maybe you should get one. The quotation within the quote, I'm going to be a historian, should be said in the voice of a moron because you are ridiculing the other person who is not even represented in the dialogue. It is just implied that the other person is there. There are a variety of joke structures and types of humor. Let's put a few to ink. Setup dash punch. Setup, punch, tag. A tag is another punchline without having to set up a new joke. Ideally, a joke has a short setup, strong punch, then as many tags as possible without exhausting the original point. Tags are verbally economical. They build momentum in the comedic dialogue. One-liners. Henny Youngman is the purported king of the one-liners. Take my wife, please. Storytelling. Bill Cosby and John Leguizamo. Blunt honesty. Tom Segura. Hyperbolic humor. Simile. Metaphor. Improv. Audience interaction. Better known as crowd work. Big J. Ogerson. Feigned improv. Bizarre word or syntax. Theatrical stand-up, Eddie Izzard. Absurdist humor, Andy Kaufman. Callbacks to earlier jokes, ridicule. Ribaldry, Jim Norton. Imitation or impressionism, Frank Caliendo. Cynical humor, David Croft. 
Blue or Gallows Humor, Doug Stanhope. Derision, Don Rickles. Droll, Caustic, Criticism, Deadpan. Epigrammatic or Wordplay, Slapstick, Self-Deprecating. Where to start? Goal setting is the universal adaption of the productive life. For more on goal setting, listen to any, literally any motivational speaker. Don't get on stage for the first time because you're drunk at an open mic night. Come prepared. Write, edit, discriminate, refine, and memorize what you plan to do for your first performance. The key word here is to plan. That being said, chances are that in the moments leading up to taking the stage, everything you thought was funny will be ringing in your head as decidedly not funny or entertaining in the least. Chances are that panic sentiment is accurate. Nevertheless, that is what you have to work with, so suck it up and press on. For nerves, you can have a couple of drinks, you can take Xanax or a lot of magnesium, although magnesium causes diarrhea. To add to this, or in place of these substances, you should breathe deeply to a point just short of hyperventilating just before you go on. This seems to calm the nerves, give you a mild, tingly buzz, and it circumvents the possibility of a panic attack in which you are on stage and can't breathe. It does this by over-oxygenating the blood. Also mentally, you can approach your stage time with the mindset that you are not getting on stage to make people laugh, as that is a daunting task. Instead, think of it as getting on stage to share information, such as one would say into a mic. Someone in a red Audi left their lights on. It takes a lot of the edge off. But you really need to visualize your set as as that, just sharing information. Convince yourself of it. Also make sure to forego any and all caffeine and or stimulants of any kind leading up to your set. They'll just serve to magnify anxiety. Beta blockers lower blood pressure, which reduces anxiety. Surgeons use beta blockers before surgery to keep their hands steady. Sometimes, not all the time, you can stand up and look out over the audience and build an innate sense of domination. This works very well if you can develop the mindset for it. This is what I have come to rely on for the possible jitters before big shows. To do this, you need to be standing firm and balanced. You should be no farther back than a peripheral view of the front rows, meaning you are able to see most of the faces. All you need to do is mentally stand on the strength of your opening bit and look over the audience and convince yourself that they have no chance. You are going to dominate. They are the weak and you are the tyrant. You are the boss. You can read the faces as accepting rather than judgmental. Go ahead and mistake their kindness for weakness because that dominance puts you in the driver's seat. This approach takes training. It also takes some elements laid out in the next paragraph but well honored, this technique should work for most audiences. If you could somehow force your mind state into anger, hostility, or rage, there would be no issue with the anxiety, as those dispositions are mutually exclusive. A lot of veterans will tell you never to use alcohol to sedate anxiety, but there are plenty of veteran comedians who live and make a living on the sauce. It is really up to you. The nerves die down the more experience you have, For some, anxiety goes away completely. For others, there is always anxiety. That is the brass tacks on jitters. It doesn't hurt. I could argue it is actually requisite to go to a few live comedy shows and scope out the particular open mic night at which you plan to debut your stylings, soak in the environment, read the room, take note of the peculiarities, and even write some jokes about the features of the room and the setting. When you go to the open mic, which you plan to be a part of down the road, wait until it is over and most everyone is left, and step onto the stage. Pace. Act out yourself delivering, and delivering well to a baited audience. Even if there are a few stragglers left in the room, just suck up the embarrassment of appearing the dilettante or the wannabe stand-up comedian is rife with moments of embarrassment. The comedian, might I say, the successful comedian learns to deal with it, You need to picture yourself ahead of where you are. That is why you should lag behind after the mic is over and get on the stage, because that is your future. There is a scene in The Pursuit of Happiness in which Will Smith tells his son not to let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. If you have a dream, guard it. Which brings me to a point. 
You will find that it never serves your better interest to tell people that you're a comedian or that you do stand-up comedy. It never ends well. Trust me, it never ends with you getting a Netflix special. Homework. Read the books on comedy and watch the stand-up comedy specials. Make sure to include a few books on how to write comedy, because ultimately, your success in the field is contingent upon the merit of your material. Two nuances of stand-up not mentioned on the list of joke types and structures. 1. Character-driven comedy. 2. Material-driven comedy. Character-driven comedy, first off, is much harder, dare I say, impossible to steal. It is comedy in which the substance, the real meat of the comedy, is in form, style, tone, energy, or, like thereof, cadence and rhythm in the delivery of the material. The substance is in the character of persona. The audience is laughing at the way in which the comedian is acting or delivering. Material-driven comedy is easy to steal. The gem of this comedy is in the written material and would be funny delivered in a multitude of ways. On the continuum of character-driven to material-driven, I would argue that the comedians in the top 10 percentile of the character-driven style would be Jim Carrey and Sasha Baron Cohen. Although technically not a comedian, no one can steal their act because their act is entirely the persona they have developed. 75% character-driven would be Rodney Dangerfield, Dov Davidoff, Wanda Sykes, and Jackie Mason. In the midpoint between character-driven and material-driven, you might find Dane Cook, Woody Allen. Approaching material-driven comedy are the likes of Mitch Hedberg, Tom Segura, and Ellen DeGeneres. This is not to say that any of these comedians deliver with any less than mastery of the craft. And the most well-known comedian who is almost, if not entirely, material-driven is Bob Hope. Bob Hope also had writers. Allow me to provoke a rhetorical question. What do you think of a material-driven comedian who doesn't write his own material? You start by reading the books, taking the good points, noting the bad points, and discerning the difference while realizing that there are no hard rules in this art. After a secure tenure on stage, you will come to the realization that the books don't even begin to approach the complexities of insight requisite for successful development in this art form. You begin by watching all the stand-up comedy you possibly can. Watch the videos and listen to the audio, the CDs. Watch the legends. Leave some room for absorbing the trends of contemporary stand-up comedy, as that is the arena which you will be entering. Watch it all, and when you're done, watch it again. Find your favorites, and watch or listen to them over and over, until you know them to the extent that they have become a second nature part of your personality. Learn them so well that you accidentally use a punchline you didn't write, but realize that it's never okay to steal material. Watch the legends. Richard Pryor, George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, Sam Kinison, Red Fox, Bill Hicks, Bill Cosby, Jackie Mason, Dave Chappelle, Louis C.K., Patrice O'Neill, Martin Lawrence, Rodney Dangerfield, Henny Youngman, Jonathan Winters, Eddie Murphy, Buddy Hackett, Mitch Hedberg, Bob Hope, Ellen DeGeneres, Don Rickles, Woody Allen, Steve Wright, Steve Martin, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, Dick Gregory, Jackie Mason, and many others. If any material from these comedians seems unoriginal, that is because these legends created something so contagiously creative and funny that has been stolen by countless others. That is why it is familiar. These are the comedic mavens, the trendsetters. These are the originators. These are the creators. Ask yourself two things while doing the homework of watching stand-up. One. What is funny? In this, I am not suggesting that you take inventory of the words within punchlines. I mean, dissect the concept itself and analyze how it functions. This will help you with the second question here. Why is it funny? Find the structure, memorize it, then deconstruct it. Learn it to the extent that you would be able to teach it. 
It is of paramount importance that you watch and study our contemporaries. Eddie Izzard, Doug Stanhope, David Cross, Mark Marin, Dov Davidoff, Tom Segura, Aziz Ansari, Josh Blue, Joe Rogan, Mike Berbiglia, Dane Cook, David Cross, Chris Diella, Nick DiPaolo, Adam Fiera, Tom Papa, Eddie Pepitone, Colin Quinn, Dennis Miller, Morgan Murphy, Paul Mooney, Eugene Merman, Jim Norton, Jim Gaffigan, Donald Glover, Todd Glass, Liza Schlesinger, Sarah Silverman, Daniel Tosh, Voss, Rich Voss, he's very rich, Hannibal Burris, Anthony Jeselnik, Big J. Okerson, Mushy Kaiser, Joe Coy, Lori Kilmartin, Artie Lang, Bill Maher, Wanda Sykes, Mike Kaplan, Bill Burr, Arge Barker, Amy Schumer, Andy Kindler, Brian Regan, Mike DiStefano, Tracy Morgan, Jeff Foxworthy, Tig Notaro, Dave Attell, and many others. What's funny? Why is it funny? After studying comedy for a while, you may have an internal narrative that runs like mine. I want to be able to deliver with the courage of Lenny Bruce and the conviction of Sam Kennison. I labor to wordsmith with the likes of Dennis Miller and to abstract conceptually rivaling Stephen Wright. I wish I could deliver facial expressions with the timing of Patrice O'Neill and the absurdity of Maria Bamford. I want people to absorb the sense of humanity from my work the way they did with Richard Pryor. My cynicism takes notes from Greg Giraldo and Doug Stanhope. I work every day to create as prolifically as George Carlin. I want to dominate the stage in a way that would impress Chris Rock while remaining humbly underrated with the likes of Patton Oswalt. I wish to bring as much genuine joy as Brian Regan while creating a show flamboyantly theatrical as Eddie Izzard. What I truly want is my, my career. I would also like to take Henny Youngman's wife. Earlier, we listened to many types of humor and slash or joke structure, but we did not expound on the intricacies of each type. Throughout this entire book, we will be discussing various approaches to comedy, including the ones listed earlier. Most importantly, defining each type of joke or style serves less purpose than studying, rather overstudying stand-up comedy. If you take the time to watch stand-up comedy to exhaustion, the styles and structures requisite in the development of your own material will be second nature. What's next? The assembly line of the comedic craftsman is as follows. Study, write, slash create. Edit, slash refine. Memorize, perform, slash deliver. Tape your set. Review your set. Edit slash whittle slash rewrite slash rebuild. Another trial. Tape your set. Polish slash refine slash thoroughly memorize slash file away. Repeat steps one through nine. It may be obvious, but it needs to be said. You can never have too much material. The career aspect of this art form is the adoption of a desire to build a body of work that you're proud of. Build a collection of unique work that adds to humanity's cultural tapestry. To leave the right kind of footprint. The one-of-a-kind footprint of your having graced this planet with an intellectual contribution that would never have existed had you not lived. An indelible footprint that gracefully asserts itself thereafter as your contribution, meaning that you are not, were not, nor will not be replaced. This can be the significance of our work here. What is comedy? When stand-up comedy is bad, it is a monologue. When comedy is good, it is not a monologue. It's a dialogue. The audience response is integral to the synergistic energy of the dialogue. Great comedy obviously receives laughs. But ultimately, the consummate orator does more than merely manufacture laughs. He slash she builds energy. Since it should be considered that comedy is a dialogue, not a monologue. In other words, you speak, 
they react, you speak, they react, etc. It is important to establish the pattern of call and response as soon as possible. It is the rhythm of comedy. This is why, whether or not they are aware of it, comedians get to the microphone and immediately say, give it up for who cares. These comedians are just establishing the pattern and reminding the audience that they are there to contribute as well. One of the best examples of this is the beginning of Dane Cook's double platinum selling Harmful If Swallowed. On the CD, he starts this virtuoso performance by asking the audience to give it up for blank and give it up for blank and more of this. Quite a few, actually. But the pattern was set, and the momentum and the energy of the show was, well, double platinum. An indispensable element of comedic performance needing attention in this. The first order of business in addressing a room as a comedian is to command attention while ensuring that the audience likes you. There could be volumes written about the science of this requisite interaction. But it really boils down to this. No one laughs at someone they don't like. No matter how funny that person may be. So make sure that you're likable. To be liked? Well, that is different for every person. The only universal approach is not inaction, but rather inaction. For your very first step onto the stage through your mastery of stand-up, practice antipathy aversion. In other words, make sure not to give the audience any reason to dislike you. Other than that, the obvious way to grace the room is to be funny, or to start strong. Start strong and leave the audience wanting more. In other words, start strong and end strong. What the comedian wants working in his or her favor is the uh, illusion of spontaneity. The successful comedian delivers in a way that sounds as though everything they're saying is coming off the top of their head. The best can make it look or appear as some sort of stream of consciousness performance. So, the easiest way to do this, and in turn, sell yourself to the audience to be liked to warrant laughter is to sit in the back of the room before you step on stage and write quips and observations about the room and environment that will come off as spontaneous and in the moment. A few years back, I was booked for a bachelorette party. As I was waiting to take the stage, I was analyzing the room and taking note of the obvious, the, the fact that the entire audience was composed of women, young and attractive. I thought of the adage regarding public speaking. If you get nervous, picture them naked. I filed that thought away and took the stage. The audience was drunk, and, for some unknown reason, one of the girls shouted, Are you nervous? To which I replied, No, but I am picturing you naked. That is being prepared. The best way for them to like you from the top is by being funny from the top. Start strong. Be meticulously present while in the room, on and off stage. When you get on stage, you need to match the energy level of the crowd. Then your job is to raise the energy you have inherited. If you follow an act that is high energy, and the audience is on board with that comedian, you need to start off energetic. If the crowd is dead, or the room is far less than full, make sure not to overplay the atmosphere. It comes off as both abrasive and desperate. A comedian can talk to an audience, talk at an audience, or talk with an audience. There's almost never an occasion to talk at an audience. This is because of the principle you can find in many of the books in stand-up comedy or in discussions with veteran comedians. The comedian needs to connect with the audience. Talking at the audience will never create a connection. The only time it is acceptable to talk at an audience is if slash when there is a segment of the audience, a table perhaps not paying attention. Not only not paying attention, but also talking to each other very loudly and disrupting your capacity to connect with the larger part of that audience that is interested in your act. 
On such occasion, it is totally acceptable to talk at these people loudly and compellingly until they cease to destroy the interactional environment you're trying to nurture. The comedian talks to an audience when the audience is of substantial size and slash or when the audience is loud. In other words, you are stepping on stage to address a large, energetic audience. That is when you talk to the audience. A comedian talks with an audience when the show is sparsely attended and of low energy. Don't overplay the room. With that in mind, we, as comedians, need to read a dead room and try to connect. Then try to raise the energy level. If you overplay a dead room by talking loudly at the audience, jumping around and generally delivering at an energy level that is fit for Madison Square Garden on New Year's Eve, you will never connect. A note on taking the stage. Be present to what's going on in the room, as well as what has preceded your entrance on each individual show. Address everything that is obvious to the audience. Poor lighting, a mic that cuts in and out, the obnoxious drunk guy in the front row, heckles. Address all of it, because the beauty of the live show is the unique fingerprint of that particular show. The audience will not be moved to follow you through the, your material if you are ignoring the prevailing atmosphere. Also, it should be noted that following a comedian who just spent the entirety of his slash her stage time doing improvised crowd work puts you, the next act, in a difficult position. A good host will transition for you by doing a scripted bit to get the audience off their insatiable appetite for spontaneity and attention. If the host doesn't help in the transition, your job is to get the audience on your side. And if they just soaked in 15 minutes of crowd work, they're not going to follow you immediately into scripted material. A good crowd work comedian is a fucking pain in the ass to follow. Your best bet is to start off talking with the audience while staying sharp, then gradually transition into your material. The easiest way to do this is to take your strongest bit and put it up front and to do the mental calisthenics of hybridizing this bit into a part scripted, part crowd work. Hypothetically, if your strongest bit is about drinking and driving, instead of doing it as written, you might start off with a call and response such as, can we give a round of applause for drinking and driving? Helping to control overpopulation. Give it up. Delivering the virtues of unplanned early inheritance at the expense of the expendable. Mom and Dad, make some noise. Who's got a good driving while blacked out on hardcore grain bathtub rubbing alcohol story? Start with something like that. It's aggressive, uh, which you need because you are following a comic who did non-stop crowd work. Hopefully someone in the audience offers up a solid story that you can work with. From there, segue into the scripted bit, which should be your strongest bit, and relevant to drinking and driving. Your other option is to jump into crowd work and trying to one-up the previous comedian in this domain. But what you cannot do is just force your scripted material down their throats. They won't swallow it. Trust me. The comedian's job is to connect with the body of people in attendance. To be a professional comedian, you need to build a following. The shortest distance between a bystander and a fan is through connection. So it is extremely important, even vital to the comedian, to connect with the audience. Timing. Timing for the comedian is really the ability one has to command the energy between the comedian, him or herself, and the audience. Laughter comes in all shapes and tones and is of varying duration. The comedian sticks the punchline and the audience responds. The audience response is akin to a decibel bell curve skewed to the left. The laughter in decibels spikes up quickly, then fades more gradually. Time is an adept understanding of how to drive the conversation, to call and response. The comedian wants to build energy. The best way to do this 
is to command the timing and volume of the comedic dialogue going on in the room. Since laughter fades more gradually on the right side of the bell curve timing, ideally, goes as follows. You tell a joke that gels, that comes together in a punctuation that is the natural end of a sentence or comment. You want the idea to become known as the natural end of a phrase so that you're not busy finishing the sentence after the comedic idea is out of the bag. There needs to be a natural and appropriate pause in what you're saying when the collective comprehension of the bit strikes the audience. When the idea gels, you do not want to be talking. Because this moment is the supremely important audience contribution to the dialogue, their laughter. The audience response spikes upward then fades. The timing here is really the comprehension of when to resume speaking. If you wait too long to move on, you might just lose the energy or the momentum gain from the joke. If you resume too soon, two things might happen. One is that you run the risk that the audience won't hear what you're saying because they're busy laughing. The other thing, arguably worse, that might happen is that you stomp out or stifle the laughter you've earned because they stop laughing to listen to what you're saying for the follow-up. So there's an optimal point in time as to where to resume your delivery. When you have a comprehensive understanding of timing and a thorough memorization of your material, you're able to play a little with the rules of timing. Personally, I like to give a punchline. Then let them laugh and gradually, subtly give them less and less time to laugh. I do this for a few reasons. When you move, when you move on while they're still laughing, you are establishing dominance and control in the setting. And, truth be told, an audience feels much more comfortable with the competent commanding comedic professional. The best way to command the room is by asserting yourself as the driver. When you do, the audience rises to a heightened state of comfort, knowing subconsciously that you know what you're doing up there on stage. Another reason I have less and less room for laughter gradually is because when, one, I verbally step back in a hair early, I need to speak a little louder to be heard. As I ever so slightly increase the requisite volume of delivery, I add energy to the room and the response from the audience increases in accordance with the overall atmosphere of the show. In this way, I not only get laughs, but I also increase the energy and ultimately raise the titillation of the entertainment as well. It is important to appreciate that laughter is not the ha-ha cookie-cutter thoughtless response. Laughter has a remarkable amount of variability with changes in pitch, volume, rhythm, and duration, proportional to the thought that incites the laughter itself. What I must point out is that laughter, more than most other expressions we deliver, has a wide, borderline, infinite amount of thought behind it. Therefore, it is not, ha ha, this is just another dynamic charm of this medium. When someone says, squirrel, there is far less running through their head than when someone laughs. This is where the comedian needs to face the facts that there are laughs and then there are good laughs. It is essential to the success of the comedian that they know whether they are getting laughs or if they're getting good laughs. My personal preference with regard to audience response is finding and seeking out laughs that don't die or fade. My favorite moments on stage or when I can't move forward with my set because people have a response of laughter that becomes interruptive to flow of my set. I don't care as much about the sheer volume of response as much as I care for the duration of laughter. The best laughs I have ever ex personally experienced in my own life lasted minutes or even hours until I was in pain or in stitches, so to speak. On stage, though, I'm going for all types of laughs in my set. Choppy, periodic laughs, metronomic laughs, inside joke responses, guilty laughs, half groans, half laughs, shotgun outburst type laughs, 
one guy laughing alone at the wrong time and the audience laughing at his timing gaff laughs. Applause breaks and my favorite enduring laughs. A quick note on applause breaks. These are the most predictable parts of comedy. First, there needs to be a substantial crowd, meaning 40, in a venue that seats 50 or 200 in a venue that seats 199. Also, the crowd needs to be on your side or with you. From there, the easiest way to get an applause break is to say something everyone agrees with and agrees with to such an extent that they break the flow of the show to acknowledge the point. Another way is to craft an extremely well-worded rant that impervious to criticism clearly displays prominent artistry. For example, I have a bit in which I say everything that one would want to say to a boss at work. In my case, my former boss was a chef. The bit itself gets a lot of momentum before the portion that gets into the applause break. So I am going in with some steam. Then I go on a rant about how someone else must have forged his resume because I doubt that he has the intellectual capacity to spell chef because the CH sounds like an SH. I'll give you an example. I unloaded the machine gun which ricocheted off the quiche, killing the charlatan charading as a chef, clean as a machete, and a charrigan we toasted champagne with a little more emphasis and rhythm at the end and a decent audience this gets an applause break it's not the funniest material ever but the material preceding it is sharp and simply said sometimes the audience just appreciates that you have done some extra homework a long well constructed rant or diatribe ripe with alliteration an extremely fast string of descriptives or just a solid point with which everyone is uniformly in accord will earn you the applause break you seek. If you want to learn from the best of the best at making solid, cogent points that earn applause, just watch any of Chris Rock's specials. Each one is full of them. A common discussion among comedians and patrons of the comedic arts is the issue of the clean comic versus the profane. Since this has been covered in so many places, I'll leave it to others to analyze. I would like to share on the subject is that being cl a clean comedian is much, much more challenging than one might assume. We live in a world of overstimulated, desensitized people. It's hard to get an audible response out of these people without using a sharp, incisive edge like uh, profanity. One thing conspicuously absent in discussing among comedians honesty on stage I've committed myself to never lying about anything I deliver on stage the frustrating part is that people still ask me all the time is that true this is because of the pervasive tendency in the medium of stand-up for comedians to lie when their lies pollute the water my hard-to-believe stories don't hold the same gravity they otherwise would because people in the audience assume I'm lying. Well, I'm not. Yes, I extorted money from a former employer. Yes, I crashed a car going 130 miles an hour. It's all true. It is imperative that we touch upon what in the industry is referred to as selling a bit. Selling a bit is the concept of telling a joke or a bit in such a way as to compel laughter from the audience. It really comes down to, can you deliver? Is it adequately akin to salesmanship in the broad sense? The stronger the gift of salesmanship in the comedian, the more versatile his slash her act can be. Some comedians can take garbage material and deliver it with such electric charisma that it brings down the house. Dane Cook is at the forefront of contemporary stand-up comedy. He is able to take drab, lackluster scraps of B-side jokes and deliver them at a level that unmatched by his peers. My intent here is entirely complimentary. Because I said that he is able to, not so much that he has to, he takes quality material and molds it into gems that fill stadiums. 
The less natural capacity for delivery the comedian possesses, the more dependent that comedian is on the quality of his material. Let us resolve to appreciate that a healthy gift from both quality writing and salesmanship is the best course. This way, the comedian is not only entertaining, but also stimulating the intellect as well. Selling a bit really comes down to investing a tone of emotion into your material. If you deliver with emotion, whether it be hostility, annoyance, or overt monotoned boredom, the audience will feed off this delivery. It is necessary to care about what you say. Also, it is policy of mine not to dumb down my material. The audience, regardless of their intellectual quotient, does not appreciate being patronized or talked down to. Even esoteric words and references have their place. The people who understand the reference appreciate the exercise of their cerebral side. They feel as though they are part of something particular to them. It becomes a way of connecting more intimately with various pockets and segments of your audience. The people who miss the reference are drawn towards a sharper focus. Out of concern not to let another anecdote to slip past. Again, these obscure references are best peppered throughout a set in small portions. If you want to develop as a comedian, make sure to take the hard gigs. Take the stage when you know you're going to tank. Don't bail mid-set if you're not connecting. Use all the time you're given. On this point, I submit one of the most legendary performances in the history of the art form. This set was in an amphitheater in Camden, New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia, in which juggernaut comedian Bill Burr got booed by an enormous crowd of people. He addressed this not by bailing out, taking his check and leaving the nightmare behind him, but rather standing his ground, fighting back, and winning the crowd over. Bill Burr turned a stadium of boos into a standing ovation. Look it up on YouTube. The search is for Bill Burr, Philadelphia. The audience. There are good audiences, great audiences, inattentive audiences, drunk audiences, corporate gigs, and a variety of other audience types. Greg Giraldo once told me, there are some audiences you just can't win over. He's absolutely right. My personal rule regarding how well my set went with regard to the audience is this. If there are 10 or more people in the audience, and they are all paying attention, and can clearly hear me, if I bomb, it's my fault. Even if it is just an open mic with other comedians, if I have their full attention, it is my job to sell what I have. Seinfeld said it best. Bad comedians help you edit. Good audiences allow you to explore. I know this sounds insane, but after years in the trenches, you might feel the same way I feel. Great audiences? I have no time for them. I no longer care to entertain pushovers with no discrimination of taste. They don't feed my self-esteem. I want some fight. I like varying levels of difficulty from the receiving end of my act. The only thing great audiences allow you to do is step away, way out of your comfort zone. Go rogue, experimental, and see where it takes you. For all their purposes, I want to fight. Writing stand-up comedy. Keep the pen moving. The game over a long enough timeline becomes the challenging of beating a writer's block. When starting out as a writer, before you have found your voice as a comedian, I highly recommend working quantitatively in the development of material, writing as much as possible. This is for a number of reasons. First, you can consider this a numbers game when you're not under the time crunch of the industry writer's table. The more pages you punch out, the more likely you are to stumble ass backwards into something funny, something of quality. Second, you will ultimately find that it's vastly easier to fix or punch up a crap piece of writing than to create a gem of comedy from the blank page. The reality of stand-up comedy as a career is that writing and building material will make or break your career. People watch your comedy, and when they get to the end of your video or special, they want another special. Otherwise, you and your act 
are filed in the deep recesses of their mental cabinet. You can never have too much material. And trust me on this, building material comes at a tremendous expense in both time and energy. Remember that everyone in the industry burns out at some point, even at multiple points. The reality of the comedian is not the show, it is not the lights and attention. The vast majority of a comedian is labor. As soon as your comedy special hits Netflix, your audience demands new material, a full set that they have never heard before. And at that point, you will be the headliner, which means the weight or the pressure of the entire show rests upon you to deliver a captivating new 45 minutes or more. It's a lot of work. At the moment of writing this, I am just past my 12-year mark in the field. At my 7-year mark, I really buckled down. I quit drinking. I set new comedic standards for myself in form and work ethic. I decided that I would never lie on stage in my act. And I started writing tirelessly. I needed to write. To fill all the excess time I used to fill killing brain cells at the bar. I took a boot camp approach to writing writing in excess. I kept the Charles Schultz quote as my mantra. Writer's block is for amateurs. I wrote with an abnormal, prolific demand on myself. I took Adderall and caffeine and would bend or write for periods of 8, 10, or even 14 hours straight. The muscle of productive verbal expression developed out of necessity because it is one thing to write for one hour every day but it's an entirely different burden to keep the pen moving for 10 hours straight. Nevertheless, if you want it, if you want to leave your indelible mark on our rich medium, this abnormal work ethic will soon prove to serve its purpose in your success. Anyone can write about something for 15 minutes, and most people can muster the discipline to bump this up to an hour, but when you force yourself to keep writing without interruption, pause or setback for 10 hours you are forcing yourself to fight writer's block and generate creatively for enduring links it's equivalent to a bodybuilder finally exploring lifting with a full range of motion force yourself to overcome writer's block repeatedly for hours then at some point it ceases to be an issue you never face it again a bonus to this monumental development is that somehow your writing will, in volume, develops qualitative aesthetics. Write out a bizarre interaction you had. 5. There is a list of 101 relevant thought-provoking writing prompts in chapter 13. Sometimes I enjoy making lists or just creating interesting word pairs at length, such as lonesome pleasantries, authentic plagiarism, sensual small talk on censored meteorology, breathtaking lazy eyes, shattered face, blissfully illiterate, backstabbing merriment, etc. Write quantitatively. Edit qualitatively. Go to a Barnes & Noble and take a look at the topic covering the magazines. Just keep writing, and you will develop after countless pages of quantitative writing. Not only will you find your voice as a comedian, but your writing will have developed into a more qualitative comedic writing. And I urge you not to lie. The audience might laugh, but in the grand scheme of things, lying ultimately serves no purpose. Use your leverage as a comedian to address issues that matter to you. Issues that move you. I like to write as much about a given topic as possible before doing any homework on the subject. In this way, there is a natural unfolding of originality. After I have exhausted the subject on my own, then I go to Wikipedia and write material based on what is said there on the subject. I firmly believe in this approach of not doing any research before attacking a subject. Your work is then unique and original by default. You will also find, over time, that you will be able to write more on the subject without doing homework, which clearly gives your creative brain a full workout. The more you can explore and deliver on any topic without doing the research first, the more adept you are in the realm of debate, say, with a heckler, 
or just the overall skill of intellectual marksmanship. When you have developed the skill or exhausted the avenues of exploration for a given topic, then begin to work with the literature on the subject. We're comedians, not academics. We are not constrained by a professional necessity to affix our creations with the body of work done in our field. In fact, we are highly discouraged from referencing any other work. Citations make for the blacklist in comedy. Don't adopt any formula in your writing, especially any formula taken from a book on comedy. <laughs> to remain versatile, one needs to find material from a range of intellectual on-ramps. The trick is really simple. Keep the pen moving. When you eventually come upon comedic gems somewhere within the expended link, exploit that idea. Write it out. Rewrite it. Write 100 punchlines when five will do. One punchline and four tags. And then take the topic and write it from the opposite stance from which you originally stood. Make analogies. Go online and take a look at the list of idioms about the topic. Or go onto an online slang dictionary or a thesaurus to find interesting words and wording. It is important that you use different words from set up to punchline. Any punchline loses its edge when the audience just heard the very same word five seconds ago. Use a thesaurus for help with this. Instead of saying, in the front seat of the car, say, in the front seat of a Honda. In this way, you change the redundant in slash in to a in slash of, and you added a descriptive Honda without adding any words. Always use the harsher, more aggressive word of the options in the punchline, not the setup. Trick. A simile, i.e. blank, is like blank, comes off very scripted. I'm of the opinion that a comedian would be better off just stating the other concept. The closing bit to my first hour special, Audible Toxicology, is as follows. There was a girl complaining at the bar. People just use me for sex. Well, maybe that's all you have to offer. You you have a personality that leaves a lot to be desired. But you got a nice rack. Play the hand you're dealt. You don't hear me complaining about how my modeling career never took off. I could easily made the mistake of turning that last line into a simile. That would be like me complaining about my modeling career. In this case, I would argue in most cases when you write a simile find a way to turn it into a less of a formulaic structure write just write about everything just pump out as many pages as possible and realize that most of the writing is ultimately garbage nevertheless just put more and more and more words onto paper writing tips for the comedian summary start by writing anything don't attempt to be funny. Instead, look for original insights, cogent points, and creative wording. In writing about anything, it is imperative that you learn to be able to write far too much about that topic. The gym for comedy writers is the exercise of always being able to produce more. Even in ludicrous amounts, such as 100 single-paced pages of points about winter. That is actually not at all unreasonable never impede your writing with rules write everything you will end up keeping most of it to yourself the trick to writing for 14 hours straight is coffee and while you're writing every time you have a, a tangential thought just write it in the margin when you run out of ideas go back and write to completion all the tangents while continuing to write more tangents in the margin so it becomes perpetual. Trust the process and be patient. In the beginning of this career, you'll write a lot of garbage. Garbage of all kinds. Uninspired, unoriginal, pointless, insightful but not funny, etc. Be patient and continue to study other successful contemporary comedians. Trust that your writing will improve to the exact extent that you burn through pages. Don't use the same descriptives in the setup and the punchline. Make the idea come together at the natural pause in a given statement. Use an online thesaurus if you need more energetic words. 
Glossaries of idioms offer insightful topical wording with which to dabble. You can also look through an online thesaurus of slang dictionary for interesting word choices. Write until you find a premise that would allow for many punchlines. Then write an excessive amount of punchlines you can turn into tags. Write ten times as many punchlines as you need, then cherry pick the good ones. Remember, the payoff of a joke should substantiate the investment. If the setup is long, there had better be a slew of rewarding punchlines to achieve a justified return on the investment. The attention paid to the setup. If something is offensive or disgusting, the payoff should be an adequate return on the risk ventured. Keep paper and pen with you throughout the day to jot down ideas. Learn to accept when you have developed and thus throw away older, weaker material. Let it go.